Hello and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. I am Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for being here. Earlier this month, I wrote about some of the things that we are changing from last year to this year. And a big part of that is how we are incorporating technology. Let me start by saying that it is not easy and it never goes as smoothly as you plan. When I took the job at Union, I knew that we would have some great resources and facilities to use, so I wanted to jump all in on being data-driven. Little did I know, the same day that I was hired, they also hired a data collection agent. Yep, that was me too. When it comes to data and tracking, I am that person. I will be the first to admit that this is not a perfect process. It will be one that will be refined many times, but here are a few tips on how to make it more efficient and save you countless hours of time. Here is Becoming a Data-Driven Program, Part 1. Step 1. Start with the scoreboard and work backwards. How will it affect the bottom line or the end goal? Collecting data shouldn't start with what we can gather, but begin with what you want to achieve. Then look for the data that will impact that. Fergus Connolly. Before you start, there are a few important questions that you need to ask yourself and your coaching staff. Number one, what is important to us? Number two, does it transfer to the game? And number three, how can we communicate this effectively to each player? It's one thing to just collect data and another completely to use it to help our players get better. I'm the first to admit that collecting data can be a monumental task, but if it's important to us, then having objective feedback and a system for collecting it is vital. We also need to understand that if it doesn't transfer to the game, then it doesn't matter. Lastly, if we can't communicate it to the player in a simple and concise manner, then we don't understand the data well enough. We have to know what we are looking for, we have to understand why it's important, and we have to know the player to communicate it effectively. The last thing we want to have is our players confused by what we say, or for us to change our mind several times on what we're interpreting. If we can't do this, the best outcome is that we're just using it for evaluation and not for player development. And the worst outcome is that we make our players worse. So, here are a few things that we're looking at to try and get a picture of how we can help our players get better. What we're tracking. Flightscope in-game data from last season reports. Thanks to Baseball Cloud, all of our in-season reports were posted on a one-page report based on several metrics we asked for. Those metrics include exit velo per pitch, location and pitch type, launch per pitch, spray charts, and hot zones. Now the downfall of this is we only were able to record during home games and so we only got about 15 games and not a huge sample size. How are we using it to correct issues? When going over player reports, one of the first things I always ask is, what is something you feel you do well and what is something that I can help you with this offseason? This involves the player, but it also shows me how aware they are about themselves. For me, in-game data is king. It's the ultimate test of understanding if what we are doing is working or not. It takes the opinion out of my hands and the player's hands, and we can get an objective look at the things we do well and the things we need to work on this offseason. Again, if it doesn't help with transfer to the game, then it doesn't matter. When looking at these reports, there are a few things that we need to consider. Number one, I want to know what the player is doing well. I know this sounds extremely obvious, but sometimes we get hung up on what the player can't do than what the player can do. This is especially valuable in season when it is not the best time to make major swing overhauls. A great second step to this equation would be, does the player even know they do this well? It may not be as obvious to the player as it is to us. There has been countless examples of MLB players getting traded to teams who notice these trends and turn their player's career around. I have no insight to these instances but I want to do my best to communicate these things to the player so that they can be aware of their strengths and their areas of improvement. So how are we using each of these metrics? Let's start with exit velo per pitch, location and pitch type. Here's a report from one of our players. If you'll notice, he hit fastballs fairly well with an average exit velocity of 80, and he had an average launch angle within the range that we wanted most of our hitters to have, which was 14.1. For most of our players, the goal is 10 to 15 degrees, and to compare, Pete Alonso's this year is 13.8 degrees. But if you'll notice, he struggled greatly with breaking balls and couldn't keep them off the ground. His average launch angle for breaking balls was 0.6. For this player, they landed right in front of the plate. This was a conversation that we had with this player all year long, but data also backs up our observation. So now the question is, what are we doing about it? 
we need to look at this holistically. For this player, is it an approach issue, a swing issue, timing issue, or pitch recognition and adjustability issue? This is another area where we need to involve the player and ask. We can all have our theories, but it only helps to understand the player's viewpoint as a starting point. If we solely use the data to tell the player what's wrong, I think we're missing out on three quarters of what is actually happening. I don't think that most players will be completely bought into changes if we don't look at this holistically and get their opinion on the issue. In the end, it's not our career, it's the player's career. So this particular player had a swing issue where he gets extended early. So when he's on time, he could hit the fastball really well. But this poses a problem when he isn't on time and he can't adjust his body, even if he recognizes the pitch early enough. This offseason, we're working on starting in a better position in a setup and landing in a less locked out position when he lands on his forward move. The next metric we're going to look at is launch angle per pitch type. This chart shows one of our promising young players. Knowing the player, he has great hand-eye coordination and bat-to-ball skills, but he also weighs 130 pounds, so one of his goals this offseason was to put on 15 more pounds. Why does launch angle matter with this particular player? Well, we don't want to be hitting the ball straight into the ground. And if you'll notice, this player's average launch angle on all of his pitches was 3.4. He hit a ton of balls that had several hops before getting to an infielder. I know the goal is not to hit it on the ground, and especially when it has to bounce several times before it gets to the infielder. Our goal for most is to hit line drives over the infielders, and the average launch angle of 3.4 isn't close at all. Again, we need to look at this holistically. Approach issue, swing issue, timing issue, pitch recognition or adjustability issue, with this particular player, he had no trouble putting the ball in play, so we had the conversation of not swinging at pitchers' pitches. He wasn't a threat to strike out a lot, but would get himself out and get jammed or roll over pitches that were off the plate. We also want to tick up his launch angle a little bit to turn his hard ground balls into line drives and his choppers into ground balls that are trying to break the infielder's shins. I wish I could trademark that last line, but that one is all Dan Hefner. The last report we are going to look at today is hot and cold zones. This one is probably my favorite to look at. As I alluded to earlier, sometimes players have no idea what areas of the strike zone they hit hard and what they don't. Being able to understand this is vital to being a productive hitter long term. So how are we using this? In season, do we know what we are hitting well? And how often are we swinging in that zone? Using both of these, we can set up BP rounds that curtail to the specific player and you can get a point for each ball you swing at in those zones. Most coaches do these rounds in practice, but having data to back up specifically on what your zones are is extremely beneficial. For the offseason, we understand that each player is going to have some cold zones, even Mike Trout, but understanding what they are is half the battle. We can then narrow down what is causing the issue and work on it during practice. For this player in this offseason, we will be focusing on working on not swinging at pitcher's pitches. He can hit, and he will only get better if he lays off the up and in and low and in pitches. For in season, a simple chart with plus or minus for whatever is important to you, such as fastballs in the middle of a zone, you get a plus for a swing and a minus for a take. This runs into a few issues, such as taking something on the black in a hitter's count, but if it's important to us, we have to give feedback to our players on when they make good and bad decisions at the plate. Driveline has a fantastic series on this, and I will make sure to link that in the article. If you don't have the convenience of an analytic staff, come up with a simple system for your players so they can fill out during games and keep track of these during the season. Training this on a daily basis can go a long ways in training better decision makers and for building more aggressive hitters. I know this is a lot to go through, and I know that a lot of our listeners will not have the ability to track some of this information. The biggest thing I wanted to get across with this article was trying to simplify the endless metrics that we can use to measure hitters. When your data collection team is a team of one, this can seem extremely daunting. So knowing what to look for with each player is a major key. In the end, we want our players to know themselves, to know their strengths and their deficiencies. It's our job as coaches to help our players understand this, but to also set up a practice environment that enhances their strengths while continuing to work on their deficiencies. This is the essence of true individualized player development. Thanks again for listening. Have a great week. Coaches, your players aren't afraid to work hard. They just can't afford to get it wrong. And that is why you should attend the 2019 Skill Acquisition Summit hosted by Randy Sullivan's Florida Baseball Ranch and the Strength of Skills from the Netherlands. This annual event will take place on October 12th and the 13th in Lakeland, Florida. 
This event will have a premiere panel of presenters including Franz Bosch from the Netherlands and Rob Gray from Arizona State University. The most forward-thinking coaches in the business will funnel the information down to the bare bones of on-the-field application of leading-edge skill acquisition and motor learning science. You will leave equipped to help your players optimize the return on their training time. For more information, call 1-866-STRIKE-3 or go to floridabaseballranch.com backslash summit. Presenters include Franz Bosch, Rob Gray, Martin Nyhoff, Bart Honegroff, David Mann, Paul Venner, Ron Wolforth, and Coach Randy Sullivan, who will serve as host and moderator for this exciting event. I will be in attendance, and I hope to see you there.